bit. Okay, that's fine. Thanks very much, Laura. And good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all of you, wherever you're from in the world. Lots of different places I can see by your names. And it's lovely for me to be here with you this afternoon and looking at the topic of bringing creativity into the Young Learner classroom. And what I'm really interested in talking about with you this afternoon is creating a classroom culture where creativity can thrive and that it can thrive in any context in which you're working. Um, let's have a look or perhaps you can tell me, type in the chat box, what, what exactly is creativity? What do you immediately, what words come to mind when you think of creativity? Would you like to type some ideas in the box? Wonderful, fantasy, imagination, innovation, absolutely, fantastic, non-conformity, self-expression, wonderful, okay. So creativity then is very often described as thinking out of the box, as being to do with fresh, divergent responses, new ideas, objects, artifacts, new problems or ways of looking at problems or original ways of looking at problems. And of course, when we think about children and our foreign and second language classes, our children often come to our classes not knowing very much language, not knowing very much English. Of course, they know their first language. Um, but they are full of creative potential. But very often what happens, because they don't know very much English, we actually don't take advantage of their potential for creativity, which can enrich and enhance learning so hugely. And what are some of the ways that learning can be in, enhanced in the young learner classroom with creativity? You may, write, you may like to put some of your ideas in the chat box now. There are many, many benefits and advantages. For one thing, we develop children's cognitive skills, things like comparing, contrasting, imagining, hypothesizing, that kind of thing. And also their metacognition, their metacognitive skills by actually getting them to reflect critically on their own learning and to become more self-aware. And of course, creativity in the classroom leads to engagement and motivation. And as we all know as teachers, these are key for successful learning. They lead to a sense of ownership and a feeling of success. And very often, our students, our children, who are strong in other areas of the curriculum, for example, music or painting, they can actually use the areas in which they have strengths in order to support their learning in English. Creativity and thinking creatively also, of course, promotes flexible, fluid, flexible thinking. And it also provides for our students a personalized challenge. And as we all know, personalization is hugely important in any classroom. The other thing I would say about bringing creativity in the young learner classroom right from the start is that it develops skills and qualities in children that they will need throughout their education and throughout their lives. For example, things like persistence, patience, perseverance, resourcefulness. And of course, if we start working on creativity when our children are in primary or even in preschool and kindergarten, what we're actually doing is laying the foundations for the future when our students will be able to cope with more abstract con concepts and be able to use their creativity in more um, sophisticated ways. So some key ingredients of creativity that I think it's important for us to establish right from the very start. And you can see these up here. Um, first of all, engagement. Engagement, which essentially are when our children, when our students are absorbed in the challenge of learning, that they are emotionally engaged with learning and that we also see observable progress taking place. For us as teachers, engagement is the starting point of everything. If we don't have 
engagement, children's engagement. We're not going to um, get very far in being successful in um, teaching them uh, English or anything else. I always like uh, this little quotation from Andy Griffiths and Mark Burns' work. They talk about engagement being the fertile soil that enables sustainable learning to take root and flourish. And this is what we need, the kind of culture that we need to create in our classrooms where learning can take root and flourish in this way. And of course, when it does, we move on to the second item in, our, in my flow chart, which of course is actually flow. And that, of course, is the concept um, by Csikszentmihalyi, originally, um, originally developed in the context of um, American sports people, and it is to do with positively harnessing the emotions in completing a task. So flow is to do, I always remember my daughter when she was at school, she used to say, uh, mommy, I'm on a roll with my essay. In other words, she was doing something that she wanted to do, she wanted to um, complete it, and the motivation was coming from the inside rather than a kind of carrot and stick approach. And of course, when we get engagement and when we get flow, that leads to creativity. And creativity, as we've already mentioned, is to do with fresh, original, new ideas, problems, objects, um, and so on. To do with inspiration, as some of you put in the chat box, uh, innovation, imagination, and so on. But I think there are a few key points to make about creativity um, here and before we go on. And the first one is that creativity doesn't just come out of thin air. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. That creativity always arises from something. And in terms of our young learner classroom, this may be a text, a picture, a story, a problem, an idea. But it always comes from something. We can't just expect our students, or indeed anyone, to be creative out of nothing. Leading on from that first point, I think it's important for us to recognize that creativity in our young learner classroom needs a framework, a template, if you like, a framework in which our learners create. And very often, this means with us as teachers, building up an example or a model first. And when we do that, it's not actually restricting for our students, for our children. It actually allows them to focus on their ideas. And so to really um, act out, live out their creative potential, as well, of course, importantly, in a foreign and second language context, giving them the language, the confidence in the language, and confidence and competence in the language to be able to be creative. The, the third point I just make about creativity here is to do with, yes, of course it is due, to do with inspiration, to do with playing with ideas, but there is a lot more to creativity than that. It is also to do with disciplined thinking, with making an effort, with focusing on detail, and with building up the skills in our students that will enable them to be creative. So skills building work that underpins creativity is very, very important. And the last point I'd just make here before we move on is the importance of fostering in our children a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. And I'm sure there may be a lot of you here who recognize that I'm uh, referring to the work of Carol Dweck at Stanford University, and actually the importance of when we give feedback to children of focusing on the effort that they're willing to make, that they're willing to go back to try again, to revise, to rework something, to make it even more creative. And actually, and by the way, if any of you are interested in following up on that idea of growth mindset, I did do a webinar uh, in which I discussed um, that much more fully with Macmillan in 2012, and you'll find that in the webinar archive. But on with creativity now, what I would like us to look at 
in terms of creating a culture in which creativity thrives in our classrooms, I would like to look at seven pillars of creativity. And these seven pillars are generic pillars that I think allow us, whether we're working with preschool, early primary, early secondary, late teen, adults, in fact, actually anybody, um, that allow us to create the, con the optimum conditions for um, create creativity. So what we're going to do is have a look at those pillars of creativity now. And you may like to be, you could actually write in the chat box if you like, and um, predict what some of them might be, or just think about it in your head and see at the end if, you, if these um, seven pillars resonate with you um, and you, uh, you can relate to them and think they may be applicable for your own classroom situation. Now, the first one is common sense, but just so hugely important. And this is to do with building up positive self-esteem. If our children lack self-esteem, this becomes a barrier to feeling confident or competent to be able to be um, creative. We need, as teachers, in our approach, in our whole, the whole way we are in the classrooms, to recognize individual strengths, to value their contributions, to respect divergent views, to recognize that all our children are different, to actually foster an atmosphere where collaboration and interaction are the norm. And if we do this, if we build up positive self-esteem, we will find that our learners are more willing, more confident, more ready to take the risk um, that is in, uh, that characterizes creativity and have the confidence to self, to express themselves, as somebody put in the chat box earlier, in a creative way. And actually thinking about self-esteem, it's worth going back right way back to the last century to have a quick look at Maslow's pyramid, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and actually how important this is um, in uh, providing these optimum conditions for creativity. We can see at the bottom the kind of physical needs, you know, have our children had breakfast or lunch? Um, are they thirsty? Do they need water? Is the classroom light? Are they cold? Are they warm? Um, the kind of safety needs that we need to think about, safety in the literal sense with our young learners, that there aren't sort of cables and electric sockets that might be dangerous for them, but also in the sense of um, feeling respected, feeling um, liked, feeling non-threatened and included in the classroom. Um, we need to also consider social needs um, that our students feel, feel valued, um, feel included, and their esteem needs, which we'll look at in a little more detail just in a moment. And, but all of these needs um, create the conditions for um, students to um, be creative and work to their full potential, as in self-actualization at the back. And some of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with the real bottom need under physical these days. Some of you may have seen it on social media, which is, of course, um, Wi-Fi. OK, but thinking about esteem needs in detail, um, these are usually, there are usually five components that are identified as self-esteem. The first one is a sense of security. Um, I feel safe. A sense of identity. I know who I am. A sense of belonging. I know I'm included here and I belong here. A sense of purpose. I know why I'm doing what the teacher has asked me to do. And a sense of competence. Um, I feel that I can um, do this competently. Now, of course, there are masses of activities and um, procedures that we can adopt in the classroom to um, build up children's positive self-esteem. Um, and we just have a look at a couple of things now. 
Um, first of all, let's have a look at this activity, Magic Combs. This is an activity that I've known for absolutely years and years. If you happen to be working with students who cover their hair, you can do magic fans instead. And this is an activity um, to build up children's sense of, their, of a positive identity. And what you do is get your children to draw a comb with the number of teeth in their first name. So for example, my name's Carol, so I would draw a comb with five teeth, and I would write the letters of my name, one on each tooth of the comb, and then I would ask um, the children to think of a positive adjective to describe themselves beginning with each letter. So for example, my name's Carol, I would think, ka, 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 oh dear goodness me, I would say caring, for example. And the children um, make these combs, they can then exchange ideas, I think I'm caring because, dot, 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 uh, they can display their combs on the notice board, and actually, if a child doesn't seem to be feeling very positive about themselves, they can get their combs um, and actually um, comb, pretend to comb their hair with their comb. So that's just an example of an activity that you can do to build up positive self-esteem. Another generic one, which I am going to mention now, is circle time. Now, circle time is very interesting because it gets mentioned most frequently in the literature on kindergarten and preschool teaching. But actually, in my experience, circle time works with preschool, yes, primary, secondary, and adults and trainees on um, teacher -to education courses as well. Circle time is wonderful because it provides um, an opportunity for personalization. It provides practice for listening and speaking and it fosters turn-taking and respect, listening to others. It is social and it is cooperative. It also, of course, which is a great benefit to us as foreign language teachers, practices a particular grammatical pattern. Okay, so in circle time, what happens? We have a sentence stem, and this can be something really simple. I like plus food. So you go around the circle, saying, I like pizza, I like ham, and so on, round the circle. Or it can be much more advanced. It could be something like, um, I think the most worrying thing about global warming is dot, dot, dot. The rules for circle time is that everybody has a turn saying what they think, and everybody else listens to that. With younger children, it's a good idea to have a ball or a soft toy to pass around the circle. If a child has nothing to say, they just say pass. If they have something to say, but they don't know how to say it in English, then they say it in their first language. And circle time is a wonderful way of building up that kind of sense of competence, of belonging, of identity, um, in our classrooms that leads um, to self-esteem. To self Another aspect of building up self-esteem that I would also like to mention is to do with um, specifically developing in our students and children the ability to use um, English as the language of communication in the classroom. And Developing classroom language doesn't happen by magic. Very often people are saying, well, you know, you've got to speak English all the time. But actually, our children will only be able to speak English all the time if we teach and train them how to do it. And also, in a very natural way, if you look at the um, example on your screen um, about smoothies, okay, the milk drink smoothies, the child in the last speech bubble says, ah, oh, thanks. I get it now. I like smoothies too. I get it now. Very informal, colloquial, appropriate kind of classroom language. And actually, if we systematically build up our children's ability to communicate in English in the classroom, this leads to confidence in their language skills, of course, but also a very positive um, sense of self-esteem. 
There are many, many other things that we can do as well. Um, but actually, to get to go through all our seven pillars, those are just um, some examples. Um, moving on, let's have a look now at pillar number two. Pillar number two, model creativity yourself. It, do you know something? It's an essential rule of thumb with any skill or behavior that you want to foster in other people that you model it yourself. If you want your children to be, uh, to be respectful and polite towards you and each other, then one of the ways, one of the most important ways to achieve that is to be polite and respectful towards them. Well, similarly with creativity. But actually, it's important for us to model creativity ourselves in the way we approach our teaching and children's learning in the classroom. And this can be reflected in a myriad of ways in everything we do. It's our ability to engage our children, to motivate them, the kinds of activities, tasks, and learning outcomes that we achieve in the classroom, the way we give feedback, the way we manage the environment, the way we cater for differences and diversity as well, for example. But this doesn't mean every lesson is kind of creative fireworks. It's important for us to be creative in small ways as well. And here are some examples on your screen. Lining up, for example. This is something that children often do three or four times a day. It can be deadly dull and boring. So why not think of some creative ways to go about it? Lining up in alphabetical order, reverse alphabetical order, order of height, order of age, order of um, light to dark colors that the children are working. And you can be sure that once you start doing this, they will come up with a lot more creative ideas than you. Taking the register, again, something that is often obligatory, but time-wasting and quite dull. So why not turn it into a creative language activity? Take the register, and instead of calling out their names, or yes, I'm here, um, the children call out the name of an animal that they've learned, or food, or any other um, vocabulary that you've done. Or alternatively, take register, make register taking a geography lesson. Um, I saw this once done in a classroom, and it was fantastic. The teacher had gone through the register, giving the children, allocating different countries to the children. And so when she called their name, they had to respond with the capital city. So it went, you know, France, Paris, Spain, Madrid. Um, but actually, the children got really into it, and so they did a second round where the countries were becoming very challenging for the children. Lesson routines. Maybe you have, I often do with my uh, younger children, start the, start the lesson with a creative um, action and exercise rhyme. With older children, you might, have, you might start with um, news of the day, for example. So having lesson routines um, that are creative and engaging for the children. Similarly, with marking, we sometimes correct the work ourselves. Sometimes it's peer correction, self-correction, only corrected for one thing. Um, getting attention. You may like to do that in your own creative way. I have a little tambourine, for example, that I've actually used for years and years. Other people use a bell or put on a funny hat. I've never done that, but some people do, or stand in a special place. We can also be creative with our classroom management. Here's a little example now with something I use, which is a noiseometer, okay? And our noiseometer is like traffic lights, and the children know that if it's red, it's too loud, orange, turn the volume down, green are quiet voices. And actually, the benefit of having something like a noiseometer and being a little creative in your classroom management is that the children actually end up um, doing your classroom management for you, which is the best way for it to happen. In terms of um, providing a framework that I mentioned earlier for creativity, when we're thinking of activities 
to do with our students, I think it's important to think of a framework that we can provide that will provide a solid structure for language work as well as allow for creative possibilities. I'm going to show you um, something here now, learning grids, okay, which is based on an idea from uh, the title of the book that you can see below. And it is a fantastically simple but flexible way of generating creativity among learners in the classroom. This example here is to do with creating a story. Now, creating a story would not come out of nothing. So you would use this after you had read a story, told a story with the children, and then wanted them to create, um, to create, invent a story themselves. Now, learning grids works. Um, you have the only children it's not suitable for is children who are under the age of about eight or seven and who can't work with coordinates. But here you have, I'm not sure if this is working, I've got my pencil here, but you've got the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. My pencil doesn't seem to be working. No, it doesn't. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so the, what the children work in pairs. They have dice, okay, and they take turns to um, throw a dice and see where they land. So, for example, if I'm student A um, on the vertical axis and I throw the dice and I land on three, okay, and I'm student B and I throw the dice and I land on, um, I land on three as well. So, where have I landed on the board? Can you type it into the chat box? Where have I landed? Three, well done, Dinara, Adriana, brilliant. Okay, yeah, yeah. So what this means is that they, the students, have to use the word heart in the first sentence of their story. And the activity proceeds like this. And what happens, of course, is the children, they get very excited. They cheat as well, because if they land on, for example, they land on the hamburger or, and they can't think how to include it in the story, they usually cheat. But cheating in this context is fine. And what happens is you develop um, sentences for the story. And of course, it needs a lot more work to make it into a story. Skills building, how to use, how to connect sentences, how to incorporate sequences, paragraphing, and so on. But actually, what happens here, if you're in a class with 30 children, or 40, or 50, or only 10, every pair will produce a completely different and original story. And it is very engaging. There's a curiosity element, the randomness of the dice. There's the challenge, how to incorporate the pictures. There's the choice. They choose the images. And there's collaboration, working together. And what we have here is a very clear structure, but which leads to a creative outcome. Now, learning grids can be used in all kinds of ways. I just want to show you one example to give you a flavor. And here is an example um, in a CLIL context. OK, so here, imagine that the children have been learning about um, different uh, how to classify different kinds of insects and bugs. And in this learning grid, for example, you would have pairs, you would throw the dice in the same way, and the task for the children would be to come up with um, 10 sentences comparing the different, um, the different bugs. So for example, one child lands on butterfly, one on dragonfly, both the butterfly and the dragonfly have wings. Um, neither the caterpillar nor the worm have legs, and so on. So actually, it is very focused language practice, but creative in the sense that everyone will come up with different, um, different sentences. OK, and the last idea, which I will just show you here, and this is something that's actually on the One Stop English um, website. Top Trumps is a game that was really popular way back in the last century, in the 1970s. And it seems to have had a kind of revival. And um, this set of baby animal cards, it's a game 
essentially it's a game where you um, collect cards depending on the different categories. Um, so, for example, um, I might choose, uh, I have the gorilla card and I might say mischief 29, okay, and I would win my partners, I would beat my partners, right, rather, who had kangaroo and elephant because 29 scores highest. Okay, so if you give children a set of cards like this, and actually you don't need to worry about all this text here if you didn't want to, although you could, um, and get them to create their own games based on the Trop Trump's card, you will be amazed how creative children are in inventing games and also how strict they are in making people stick to the rules. Actually, on the One Stop English um, site for, with Top Trumps, um, I've, I've invented 30 games to go with these cards. Um, and so if your children don't have ideas, you could borrow some of those as well. But actually getting them to create games based on a game they played can be um, an extremely uh, it's, it's a, it, it has a structure and a framework, but an extremely creative outcome. Okay, so moving, moving, moving on now to um, pillar number three. Okay, pillar number three to do with offering choice. Actually, you know, for everybody, it's not just children. If we choose to do something ourselves, we have ownership of it. Um, we have investment in it and um, we are keener to do it. And my rule of thumb advice to anyone teaching children would be to offer choice whenever you possibly can. Who to work with, for example, actually not always, you don't, you don't always want friendship groupings, but these are, this is examples of when you can offer choice. Um, an activity menu, for example, on the board, five things for the lesson. Children have to choose three of them, for example, and they can do them in any order they like. Uh, we can offer choice, um, for example, when we do project work with children. Now, projects have many of the characteristics of what we're trying to achieve when we bring creativity into the young learner classroom. They're engaging, they offer a personalized challenge, they're motivating, and if we offer choice in the kind of formats that children do um, projects in, uh, it leads to a, an increased investment, if you like, and ownership, and they always make much more effort. So for example, um, our, our children might want to do a digital presentation of their project, or they might want to do a poster presentation, or they might want to do a presentation using graphic organizers, um, or in the form of a diary, or even a quiz, and a quiz either using conventional quiz cards or um, a, an electronic quiz. And I think what happens immediately, we open up the choice for students. They, um, it immediately, we, the, it becomes much more engaging rather than saying, you know, you must present a power, this by PowerPoint or you must do it with a poster. Actually giving them choice, they have investment in it and they make that um, effort and go the extra mile um, to be uh, both both careful in their work as well as, as well as creative. So offering choice, hugely important. Moving on to our next pillar now is to do with using questions um, effectively. Using questions effectively, um, we need to develop our own skills as teachers in order to frame questions that lead students to thinking creatively. You know the typical kind of question that apparently we ask 70% of the time, um, the IRS uh, question, initiation response feedback. Uh, what color is the picture? It's pink, very good, that kind of question, which does have a role in kind of checking and recall and remembering, but actually if that's the only kind of question we use, 
we close down thinking. And what we need to do in our classes is to ask questions that are interesting and challenging and, of course, comprehensible. And also, the other thing, um, give children time to answer our questions. Because you know what? As teachers, one thing we're very, very bad about is giving students time to think. Often we can't bear silence in our classrooms and we leap in and answer our own questions. In order to help us sequence and grade and differentiate questions appropriately, it's helpful, I think, to use Bloom's revised taxonomy of thinking skills. Not rocket science, and I'm sure familiar to a lot of you, but incredibly useful as a way to help us um, be aware of the kinds of questions we're asking and of the strategies we can use to lead our students to creative thinking. Six levels in um, Bloom's revised taxonomy and usually divided into lots and hots. If anyone knows what lots and hots are, please do write away in the um, chat, books, chat, chat box. Lots, of course, are lower order thinking skills and HOTS are higher order thinking skills. Now, actually, I always think it's a slight pity, this terminology, lower order, because it does sound as if they're somehow inferior and unimportant, whereas, in fact, in our second language and foreign language learning context, they are hugely important. The danger is, of course, when we only stick to lower order thinking skills and do not lead our children on to higher order thinking skills, which make learning both more meaningful, more engaging, and um, more cognitively and educationally um, worthwhile. Now, Bloom's taxonomy, revised taxonomy of thinking skills can be used to help us differentiate and make tasks simpler and more complex. And I would just like to show you here, so I, I have no idea what materials you're using in your classes, course books or your own materials or whatever, but I think it's quite interesting to have a look at the kind of typical words that are associated with each thinking skills very often um, in our course books. Obviously, I've just um, you know, classified these as it occurred to me, and obviously there is overlap. You can see that why and how there that I've put in understanding would actually equally well fit in analyzing. But I think what we can see is that the kind of typical um, rubric words that we find in our course books tend to be the ones in the bottom two uh, levels of um, the taxonomy, uh, the understanding and remembering. And also, um, looking at creating, um, if you look at that question, what if, um, this is uh, Anna Craft, somebody who writes a lot about creativity in an educational situation. She talks about what if being possibility thinking, and that being one of the um, most creative way, one of the ways, sorry, to engage our students in creative thinking, hypothetical and possibility thinking. But what I'm interested in for us as teachers, for myself as a teacher, is how I lead my children from one to the other. Because we cannot just um, expect our children to evaluate, create, analyze without uh, carefully staging it and leading them to it. And I want to give you an, a, a generic example of this now um, in the context of um, a story. You can see here how we might start off with our typical um, comprehension questions and going up, I'm not going to read all those out, you can read them there on the screen. And this is just a generic, um, a generic uh, example. 
But I think what we can see is that we don't want to just stick at that remember and understand level, which is what often happens in a foreign language context. But we want to move on and develop our children's thinking until um, there are opportunities for creativity, such as inventing a new ending, or writing the story from another point of view, for example, writing a newspaper report based on the story, or whatever, whatever, it, whatever it might be. The other thing, and I can see actually I'm rather um, going over time here. Is there a problem about this, Laura? Is everybody happy about this? Because um, I'm not quite sure how long we're supposed to go on for. But it, is that OK? OK. So, because the other thing is the importance of actually getting our students to construct interesting and challenging questions themselves. And actually, the ability to be able to ask pertinent questions is one of the most effective ways of learning. And this is just a photo that I took uh, a little earlier of question dice that I use very frequently as a post story or post text activity. It's a lovely, simple little activity where you have the question dice, the children work in pairs, they take turns to throw the dice and ask each other a question about the text or story um, depending on where the dice lands. So the importance of questions and using questions effectively to create these optimum conditions for leading our children to creative work in the classroom. Rushing on now, my next pillar, making connections. Making connections between home and school, making connections between different subjects, making connections between present and prior learning, between learning from um, different sources, the internet and reference books at school, for example. There are many um, different activities that we can do in order to get our children to make connections. I, we haven't got time to look at many of them, but I'll, I'll mention one, which um, is one that I suspect you're familiar with, which I first learned from Robert Fisher's book, Teaching Children to Think, uh, where he gets children to think of all the different things they can do with a paper cup or a paper clip or, um, or actually, as I did once years ago with a Frisbee when I was working, um, actually it was at the British Council and we had Frisbees with um, British Council branding to give to the children. So I got my children to think of all the different things they can do with a Frisbee. And here's an example of that now. And the children did this also using a picture dictionary to find the words. And um, my favorite example was a child who came up with this. This is what you can use a Frisbee for, a swimming pool for ants. And actually, I like to think that example always shows us how children, when we give them an opportunity, can actually be so much more creative than we are ourselves. OK, so moving on to pillar number six, explore ideas and keep options open. You know, something that's another thing that, as teachers, we very often do. We jump in. We close down thinking. We know the answer that we want, and we, um, and, 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 and we don't allow children to explore, to brainstorm, to play with ideas, and we ourselves to keep the options open and withhold judgment. There are many techniques and strategies that we can use to do this. One, uh, one that you may be familiar with and that I like using very much is the, um, the system of mind mapping by Tony Buzan. And Tony Buzan does actually have a book, Mind Mapping for Children, which has some lovely ideas. So here you've got on the screen, this is a mind map about tigers built up with the class. Now, if you're a teacher um, doing this, I find it's really important to pre-prepare my mind maps, um, and not, not to exactly do it, but to actually know which way it is going. And of course, it's important to use mind mapping for a kind of text like this, which is a description, rather than a narrative or linear 
um, text like a story where another tool would be um, better to use, a, a flowchart, for example. And um, when we when we brainstorm with our children like this, we can then actually build up a text together. Here's an example of a child's text um, based on the mind map that you just saw previously. And then this can lead to children choosing their own animals, making their own brainstorm, um, their own mind map, and writing, uh, writing about them. So I think important, this exploring um, ideas and keeping options open. And also, that relates back to the point about self-esteem, so that children feel confident about taking the risk and contributing ideas, um, any ideas that, that come to them, and that we then work through systematically to get um, both a creative outcome and, of course, skills building um, at the same time. For example, in building up this tiger text with the class, we might well ask the children, what, what should we put here? Shall we, shall we put tigers or shall we put they? Which sounds best, do you think? Okay, so we're actually um, modeling how we approach cohesion in a text and um, working with the children in this kind of way and actually building up um, their skills. Okay, so the last pillar now we've got to is encourage critical reflection. Now, of course, encouraging critical reflection is a very important part of developing learner autonomy, um, but it is also only through critical reflection that our students can recognize the value and validity of their own creative work. And as they grow up through the system, um, that's going to be increasingly important to actually recognize um, you know, the outcomes that come from effort, from persistence, from willingness to revise their work, and so on. And in terms of encouraging critical reflection, I'm just going to show you here this task wheel, which actually, again, I find interesting because this, um, Belle Wallace developed this wheel for preschool and kindergarten, uh, which is obviously an area that, I'm, that I work on a lot as well. But I find when I look at that kind of learning cycle that it offers potential for all of us working with uh, primary, with, with teens, um, and, and even uh, in teacher education, you know, this kind of reflective learning cycle is very important. There are many different reflective learning cycles, so which, you know, there, there's ingredients that vary, um, but I think it's, it's important to work in a way that children get used from very early stages to reflecting on their work. And it doesn't matter whether this is in their first language uh, rather than English, as obviously it's going to, in terms of language competence, it would be difficult to be in English right from the start. The other thing, of course, which is really important to build in regularly are progress reviews. Here's a little example um, of part of a progress review from a student's, from children's um, progress journal. But I think what's important to note, because very often progress reviews um, in a lot of course books, for example, involve children in saying what they like most, what activity did they enjoy most. OK, that's fine, or what did they do? But the really important thing is the why and how of learning. You know, why did this activity help you to learn? How did it help you to learn? And actually to develop those kind of metacognitive, metacognitive skills in our children from the very start, which gives them the self-awareness to be able to um, evaluate and assess their own creative work. OK, so that brings us to um, the end of the seven pillars. OK, here's a little test for you now. Can you remember the seven pillars? See if you can race to write them, write them in the box. Can you remember them? Self-esteem, yes. Yep, 
Yep. Wonderful. Make connections. Offer choice. Model creativity. Brilliant. You're fantastic. Self-esteem again. Not all of them. Model creativity. Critical thinking. Yes. Questions. Fantastic. Well, I think you have got them all, actually. Exploring ideas and keeping options open. Well done. Absolutely brilliant. Okay. So, my, my, from my own reading and from my own experience, actually making sure that in any classroom I work, whether preschool, secondary, adult, teacher education as well, I would say, to create the kind of culture where creativity is actively fostered um, both in yourself and in your learners, if you keep an eye on these seven pillars, um, I think you'll find that children um, become willing to make the effort to take the risks, to feel engaged and motivated um, to be creative. Okay, so that's the end of my webinar. Thank you very much, but I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you like, so whack them in the chat box if you have any questions. Any questions? Anyone want to ask any questions? Well, great, I'm glad it's useful. Can you send your presentation? You can re-watch the webinar, yeah. Great. Oh, by the way, I'm going to say a couple of things. I'm going to say something. I have, a, I, am a, I have actually written about these pillars of creativity in, um, for a chapter in a British Council publication that will be published this year called Creativity in English Language Teaching, edited by Alan Maley and Nick Peachy. So you'll be able to read all about the seven pillars there when it's published if you'd like to. Oh, somebody came to Appy. Fatima, how lovely. Should we assess creativity? That, 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 is, that is a really good question. I think um, it's, a, it's, very, it's a very important question. And actually, it would lead me to talking about the difference between big C creativity and little c creativity, which is made in the literature on creativity. That big c creativity um, in the real world is to do with outcomes that change the world, the works of Shakespeare, Mozart, Einstein, etc. Now, obviously, in terms of the classroom, it's not that, but actually, create big C creativity in terms of the classroom is to do with an outcome that is fresh, original, new for that child at their stage of learning. And that is contrasted with little c creativity, which is to do with um, children using any creative means they have available in their current language repertoire to get their meaning across um, in the way that they hypothesize. For example, uh, I have a lovely example from a class I visited where children were trying to guess what language they speak in Mexico. And a child came up with the word Mexicish. And that is an example of little c creativity. OK, any other questions? Okay, everyone, thank Laura? you very much for all of your questions. I think that's it for now. Um, I'm just going to see if there's anything else from anybody. Lots and hot. Lower order thinking skills and higher order thinking okay. skills. Okay. <laughs> That's good. I just also want to do a quick reminder that Carol's book um, that she's written together with Mark Ormrod uh, is coming out in March, which is Tiger Time, which is a new course uh, for our young learners. Carol, do you want to say anything about that quickly? 
uh, I, I'd love to say something about it, Laura. I, Tiger Time has been, you know, the passion of my life recently. <laughs> Tiger is a, um, a six-level course with integrated digital resources for teachers and students. And it's a course that is um, story-based, but it also has a lot of content and culture and a strong emphasis on autonomy and values. And I think a lot of the things that I've been talking about here today um, inform the thinking of the course in the sense that engagement is crucial. And one of, one of, one of the other things that I would also say that engagement is crucial, but engagement for different ages means different things. And one of the things with Tiger Time is that the concept really grows and um, evolve with the children, so that um, in level one, for example, uh, Tiger is a is a soft toy who comes alive as long as there are no adults there. Um, but at the other end of the course, level five and six, for example, um, Tiger time is there's a social learning network, and each unit is based around um, a child who comes from a different uh, country and continent. And it's much more uh, pre-teen, if you like, in its whole feel and approach to make sure that it's appropriate for children um, at every age and level. Do you want me to say more? Or is that no, that's great, Carol. Thank you very much for that. Um, Emma has just put a link as well in the chat box um, to the Tiger Time overview. So if anybody wants to find out a bit more, they can click on that and get some extra information there. Other than that, I just want to say thank you very much, Carol, for a wonderful webinar. Um, as I said, the certificates will be sent out later this week, and the video of the webinar will be available from next week for you to watch. And we will send out a link for that in the same email. OK, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. That's bye from me and uh, goodbye from Carol. Bye everyone. Lovely to see you there. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. And we'll hope to see you all at our next webinar. Bye.